All right, hello everybody and uh, welcome to the stream. Uh, just to give people some time to, to trickle in, we'll do a bit of a, a pre-show banter with our special guest, Itai. Uh, Itai comes to us uh, as a DevSecOps engineer at Tuco Incorporated. Itai, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm very excited to be here. Kind of surreal for me to presenting in OWASP. I remember going uh, all the way back since uh, you were presenting in Security Compass, back when things were still happening physically. So uh, I'm very happy to be here. Nice. That, yeah, that was a few years ago. You mm -hmm. know? Um, yeah. is, this, is this your first time presenting at OWASP? Or, uh... Uh, yeah, this is my first time presenting what I do professionally in general. So very excited. <laughs> very cool. <laughs> And uh, I, I saw in your, your bio that you have some experience in, in security engineering and code writing. Uh, were you always in, in security or did you transition from like ops or development? You are kind of speaking about how you were a teacher at one point as well. No, I wasn't a teacher. I was a student in Seneca College. I went into their uh, cybersecurity program from the beginning. I did have some computer background. I studied complete computer science in high school, but until I actually got into Seneca and I looked for what to study, I didn't even know I wanted to continue with computers. Um, at some point, I thought about going into psychotherapy before I actually locked down on cybersecurity. So I really was um, kind of fell into it, took a leap of faith. And um, got to say, I'm really enjoying my time in the field. It's very interesting. Um, it really combines the best of being working with computers while still at the same time, you kind of like have adversaries every day is something new you're not working on the same thing every day there's like other bad guys out there who kind of throw a wrench in your plans so if you like this type of fast-paced movement this field is uh exactly for you yeah absolutely uh especially if you're you know doing consulting or uh you know internal work like there, there's always something new and you know there's always some new kind of like vulnerability coming out um do you like you know, like in your, in your spare time, how do you stay up to date with the, with the latest security trends and, and vulnerabilities and things like that? So I mostly use LinkedIn for this kind of shit, uh, for this kind of stuff. I, um, I barely follow any people. Most of my following list is just like vendors, uh, stuff like zero day initiative, which publishes, uh, every time there's a new zero day vulnerability, um, other vendors, Krebs on security. That's mainly my thing. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm pretty much the same way. Uh, also, like Twitter and uh, surprisingly Reddit as well has. Uh, yeah, Reddit is also a very good source. No, so I found out why for Day existed. Just all the Reddit <laughs> oh. Okay, I mean, what what subreddits do you guys uh, you know subscribe to? Yeah, it's a, you go first, man. I, I know. Yeah, you sure, know. sure. So the cybersecurity one is uh, definitely. Uh, the biggest one, if you can get through all the messages of how do I get into cybersecurity, you do find a lot of uh, news there. Uh, another one I absolutely love is r slash uh, programmer humor. Okay. I think, I think it applies for anybody who even did remote scripting at any point of his career will find it hilarious. Um, there's NetSec. That's NetSec's true. pretty good. Yep. Yeah. And uh, there's also uh, CS career questions. If you're looking to transition, those are the main oh, yeah. ones. CSQ questions is like kind of general, like you useful in general though, like for mm -hmm. so many other things beyond like cybersecurity. So if anyone's yeah. watching, go, 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 go there, go figure it out. <laughs> Ask some questions, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, yeah, those are all really good. Uh, another one to, to consider is a uh, red team sec uh, as well. It, it seems to be like very focused on that adversarial simulation. Cause uh, I think like our net sec is, is more like generalized that mm -hmm. everything. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, those all, all work. Uh, it looks like in, in our comments, we have a, another Seneca student here as well, uh, Casa Cavitas. Uh, wow, Seneca guy, look at that. <laughs> <Your person. laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a lot of us out there. <laughs> They're infiltrating everything, what the hell? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, like we were talking about before the, the show started, everybody is either from Sheridan, Seneca, or UOIT. You know, it doesn't really seem like there's any other representation. So if you're listening and you're from a different school, definitely let us know, because it'd be good for our, like, you know, awareness. Demographics, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We got to know where we hit most, you know? If it's all Toronto schools, then you know, we gotta, <laughs> we're doing good. <laughs> well, uh, we'll keep the, the metrics anonymized. You know, we're not going to use this for, like, you know, selling selling advertisements or anything. So uh, 
yeah, just just uh, our our own awareness. Yeah, just know I don't said that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, uh, it's been a been a few minutes here with our our pre show. Um, so uh, thank you, Itai, uh, for the uh, for the little pre show banter. Uh, but before we begin with, with your presentation, a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please uh, leave that in the chat, and we'll periodically checking the uh, the comment section. Uh, you know, just to ask it to uh, to our presenter. And uh, if you need CPE credits or you have feedback for us, we're always looking to improve the uh, the streaming quality. Uh, please use the feedback form in the description of this video. And of course, if you're looking for work or you're hiring, leave that in the chat as well. And you know, you guys can can connect and coordinate. Uh, are you good to go, Itai? Uh, yeah, I'm ready. All right, the uh, the floor is yours. Awesome. So everybody, uh, welcome to my OWASP talk, uh, DevSecOps Transformation on a Shoestring Budget. Uh, the talk is about transforming an existing DevOps program that you might already have in your organization and securing it with the lowest cost possible. Um, if you have DevOps in your organization, there is really no reason for why it shouldn't be secure. So by minimizing costs, cost value, we are essentially removing the biggest blocker we have in our way to achieving that. Um, the presentation assumes that you have DevOps in your organization already, so we won't really go too deep into the technicals of like CICD technology and how to deploy it. Uh, this is more of a high level view of the methodologies and tools that you can use in securing uh, DevOps. And hopefully by the end of this talk, uh, you will have the tools and knowledge that you need to do a transformation like that in your organization. Um, a little bit about myself. My name is Itai Gervich. I'm working out of the GTA in Canada. Um, fans of South Park might know this area as downtown Canada. Currently, I'm a DevSecOps engineer in Two Cows, uh, where I work with various development teams to come up with security requirements for projects and application, and applying our DevSecOps policy that I've created to secure our CICD pipelines. And in general, uh, I've been doing security engineering and development for about, give or take, three years. So for the agenda, um, this is what we're going to go over in the next 40 odd minutes. Um, we'll have a very quick and high level overview of what DevOps is and how it works. We'll discuss what is DevSecOps and why we should do the transformation from just DevOps. Uh, I'll try to shill out a bit for open source projects and what better stage for that to do at than the open web application security project. Then we're going to go over the phases in DevOps and discuss the security controls that we should be implementing in each one of the phases. Uh, we'll then put it all together and see what a secured CI CD pipeline should look like. Uh, after that, we're going to go over some lessons that I learned that could benefit, honestly, anybody who does security engineering, not just DevOps, uh, DevSecOps. And then we'll open the platform for some questions. So what is DevOps? In a nutshell, um, it's a set of practices, policies, philosophies that merges development and operations in a continuous streamlined cycle. So before we had that, development and operations were really siloed, right? The development guys would create a product, hand it over to operations after uh, deployment, and they will run, they will manage it. As by, and there will be some kind of communication, but there was no streamlined communication channel between the two sections that was like built in part of the process, like baked into it. Um, so in DevOps, the development feed into operations and what we learn and see in production is fed back into the next planning phase for development uh, for the next cycle, sprint, version, whatever you guys are working on. Um, this results in shorter development time and continuous delivery changes in a very streamlined flow and fashion, which results in continuous integration and continuous delivery or deployment, which is the CICD pipeline, which we're going to uh, refer to a lot in this presentation. So here is a very, very high level example of a CICD pipeline. A lot of details are missing here. But in general, if we'll go through the story, we have a user here on the top left that's pushing code to GitHub or any other source code management, SCM. Um, let's say he's pushing a Python script file, a Docker file, uh, Terraform, salt states. And in this case, we use GitHub Actions as our continuous delivery, but this might as well can be Jenkins or any other continuous delivery mechanism. 
uh, and it will generate a Docker image with a Docker file and a Python script to create like a microservice and push it to a container registry. It will then apply the Terraform files to create an infrastructure in AWS. Stuff like uh, instances, firewalls, S3 buckets, um, DN DNS entries, stuff like that, more like infrastructure side. Then it will take the salt state uh, and apply it to the instance, apply the configurations. Those, so those are environmental variables, user permissions, stuff that are mostly like inside the instance rather than what's outside it. It will then pull the container image and spin it up. So since that moment that the user made a code commit, in a couple of minutes, everything done automatically behind the scene is uh, you have an app deployed with full infrastructure. Uh, Everything was automated. So from an automation standpoint, it's pretty great, right? You push in code and the changes are reflected within a couple of minutes on the front end. So going from there, what is DevSecOps? In DevSecOps, in DevSecOps uh, we use the automation that is already in place in DevOps uh, to put in security controls. We're not reinventing the wheel or adding any new phases, uh, except response, which is conditional and happens if in case there is an attack or an event, but generally we're adding in security checks to an already existing phases, right? The automation is already there. We're just adding stuff to it. Um, in proper development fashion, there should be unit tests. So imagine just adding more unit tests, but instead of checking for functionality, you're looking for security issues. Now, with that in mind, why should we even bother making security into DevOps, right? Why not just work on the app and towards the end, you ask the security team to run an assessment once it's complete so we can get all the problems in one go. Why do it uh, periodically every time discovering something little and new if we can just get a whole picture of our, secure, of our uh, security landscape at the end and then start treating it. And the way I see it, there are two points of view we should approach it in order to actually start implementing it. Um, so the first answer is the corporate answer. This is the answer you're going to give to your C-suite, to um, higher management, to project managers, to product managers, to other stakeholders. Um, from my experience and from the experience of other people I'm talking to, the best way to communicate is to boil conversations down to the dollar value, right? Uh, you need to find the, a common language with them. And everyone, no matter the position, understand what the value of money and time is for that sake. So not everyone will understand what reducing a risk score from 9 to 7 is and what it implies. But everyone understand what reducing a cost by 100,000 or cutting down the time to market by a couple of months is. You're using a language that everybody can understand. So with that in mind, uh, the first reason I'd give to why we should do it is it adheres to shift left. Uh, shift left is kind of a buzzword that started coming up recently, and it means just push as many checks as possible to the earliest point possible closer to the source. So when do you do a code scan? When the code is created and pushed. When do you uh, scan a container? When the container image is generated. You do it as close as possible to creation. Um, by doing that, you address issues earlier and you can build around those requirements. So if anything is changed because of a patch you need to apply or because of a workaround or because of change of uh, some process, you can build on top of that. Um, generally, the later you address issues, the higher it costs you to address them. And that's true in a lot of cases. An example of giving is when you build a house. Right. Imagine we're building a house here. You, we clear the lot. You, we put in the infrastructure, pipes, bring up the walls, set up the roof. We paint it. And at the end, before we're posting it to market, we bring an inspector and he checks it and tells us that the pipes are wrong. Right. They're going to leak. They're going to rot the infrastructure. Uh, in three years, this house is bound to collapse. So what do we do? We can, of course, leave it as is and accept the risks uh, that the house will collapse or we can move the pipes around, but then what happened? Do we tear everything down until we reach the pipes, move them around and then build up everything again? Um, do we just tear what we need to get to the pipes and move them? What happens if we need to move them to a place when there's something critical we can't really move, or if we need to move it, we need to move something else, like a support beam? Uh, it will generally cost us more to deal with it. There's also a cascading effect, because if you move one thing, you don't know what else it can move. Um, on the other hand, if we had an inspector working at us from the beginning and were telling us that we're putting the pipes wrong as we were putting them, um, we can just move them around here and there and continue working around those changes. Same thing applies to applications. 
Uh, if we do that, we treat stuff way earlier and we can end up with providing a more complete and secure product to market in a shorter time. Now on the other side, the engineer answer, uh, that's for people who actually do the work. Um, we, like I said, we already have a lot of automation in there. Why not leverage it? Everything is already automated. Uh, security checks is just adding another job to your build. So if the technology is already around it, it's just a matter of finding the right products to put in. You find the security or, uh, the issues earlier, and there are less things to move around if the remediation impacts any other elements or any other stuff in the product. And it also, also forces a share of responsibility. In the community, we talk a lot about how security is supposed to be a share responsibility. It's not just about the security professionals. It's also about the developers, the engineers, management, uh, other stakeholders. So here, when the owner of the code uh, or a feature pushes their changes, they are flagged with a security issue they are getting. So if we did it in the previous way that I mentioned, just bring a security expert at the end to find all the issues, um, you as a security expert need to find all the vulnerabilities, do all the scans yourself, and then figure out who owns what feature that contains the vulnerability, start hunting them down, down and working with them to remediate it, right? So most of the responsibility is on you. Here, the people are alerted right away in their build process because they're the one pushing the build and they're monitoring it. And they're seeing that the build is failing. In many tools, it will also provide you with information on what the vulnerability is, its severity, and how to fix it. So they are aware of how important it is and how to fix it. And in some cases, they will start remediating the vulnerability without your personal intervention. So it shares responsibility and it also brings results. Um, so before I start shilling for why uh, I think open source is better than vendor solution for the sake of this talk, vendor solutions are great. I love them and they have them time and place. They deal with all the annoying stuff to provide you with the most frictionless experience you can. Uh, they can provide. They give you support. They have teams. They have army of engineers who are dealing with the bugs and trying to give you the most quality um, product out there. And dealing with troubleshooting, they're dealing with all the annoying stuff that we won't have to. That's what you're paying for. That's a trade-off. But at the same time, if you have limited budget or you need to apply things fast, like if you're a, you're a startup and time is the most important resource in the world or a smaller company, then their solutions might not be the best. Um, so when you want to try a vendor solution, what is the process usually, right? Um, you set up a meeting with sales team and the sales engineer uh, shows you the product, talks to you about it and trying to sell it to you. If you like what you hear, you follow up with the demo when they bring another engineer who plays with it around, shows you the feature. But at the same time, you want to try it for yourself. It's like going to buy a car. You want to you want to test run. You want to see um, how it feels, how it works in your system, uh, because as far as you know, they could have pulled a no man's sky on you and show you a pre-recorded demo or some specific environment that, to make everything looks amazing and everything is working and all the features are great. But you still want to try it in your own system, on your own machines to see what difference it can make. So you set up a couple of weeks of testing and you have limited time. And just getting to this point that you actually get your hands on it could take a couple of weeks. And if you do like the product and you want to implement it, you have to go through a bunch of bureaucracy. It's NDAs, budgeting, data protection assessment, third party assessment. You need to deal with a lot of legal paperwork before you can import it in and bring it to your company in most cases. Um, so basically bringing in a product in can take anything from a couple of weeks to a couple of months before you even start pushing it out. We're not even talking about implementation. With open source, you can start using it in a couple of minutes, right? It's open, it's right there. You just run uh, you know, the clone, the pool, you can start using it. Even if install, it's right there. So you get to try it out right away. Um, it's free, so it takes budgeting out of the consideration. You skip a lot of bureaucracy. So if there's no, it doesn't cost anything. You don't need to go through budgeting. If you don't work with another company, there's no NDA involved. So you already kick out a bunch of paperwork that you need to fill up that somebody else then in legal department also need to get to and fill out. So it saves money also on that front. And also not to throw shade, but a lot of products use open source project as integral parts of their services anyway. If you end up like digging to logs or some of some vendor solutions you're using, you probably could find one or two open source projects that are playing a very integral part in it. Um, of course, like I said, the um, 
they deal with all the annoying bits to remove all the friction for you, but you can still get much of the same functionality for cheaper and faster. Um, General Patton said a good solution now is better than a perfect solution tomorrow. So having something in place now that catches 80% of the issue is better than starting to work towards something that might catch 99% of the issues in a couple of months to a year, depending on budgeting constraints and like internal politics and mechanics. So let's start going through the phases. So planning phase. Um, unfortunately, sorry guys, you can't automate anything in this phase done manually. This is where you meet up with the developers, with the engineers, with product, product uh, project managers, sorry, and you talk about the product stuff. You identify what the critical functions are, uh, who are the clients, what data will be consumed, what third parties are going to work with, where data is going to reside, reside, where is it going to be analyzed. Um, you generate data flow diagrams. You basically talk about the product and again, uh, you get a very good understanding of it. Once you understand it and you do threat modeling and you come up with your security requirements and you convey them to the team. So that way the development can take the security needs into consideration from the start and we'll build around them. So if you know it's going to need to use uh, this certain encryption and the, uh, when communicating with this and this elements, it will already be baked in. It will be already be considered when developers start working on it. In that phase, it also when you get to know the team and you figure out how they work and what the process is, this will really help you to understand what tools you're going to need to use and what you can leave out. So for example, there are no containers at any point in the building process, then there's no need for container scanner. Uh, this phase is also important to convey to the, uh, the security needs and the game plan of how you're going to integrate the tools in and how you're going to deal with bugs, vulnerability, and also going to set up your risk tolerance, which you're going to discuss in a bit. So moving on to code. In here, we are working basically to make sure the devs are writing secure code before committing it to our source code management platform. Uh, in this phase, we'll include uh, manual code reviews before approving merges to main. And we also have two automatic uh, processes we can have here. One of them is the static application security testing, or SAST, which is generally a code scanner that goes over the code and identifies security issues based on pre-fed templates. And there are pre-commit hooks, uh, checks that are done before you commit to the repo, before the code actually reaches the repo. Let's talk about SAS for a bit. So some considerations when picking a SAS tool. Um, some of them cover multiple languages. Some of them only cover one. So if you are working with a lot of languages in your project, it might be worthwhile using one with more language cover coverage. But if you're using like one, two, or three languages, it might be a better idea to pick a specific SAS because when a SAS is specialized in one language, language, it's usually more thorough. So do you want to have the breadth and range? Do you have some, want to have something specific? Um, some tools have the ability to only scan new code. So the scan is automatically faster. Right. Instead of scanning like a 5,000 line code of the entire uh, program for every commit, you do uh, just scan the new 150 lines you're adding. This can really save time because we expect because we expect these checks to go by rapidly and cutting down from like 30 seconds or two minutes or five minutes of scan to 50 seconds is really great. And it also makes it uh, more seamless to the engineers that need to work with this new check in their build process. Um, so figure out the risk tolerance and prioritize the severity uh, that will fail the build. Um, you want to figure out what you wh what kind of vulnerabilities you can allow into your eventually created product and which ones are absolutely red line you don't want there. Generally, it's not cost effective to try and push a product with zero vulnerabilities to market. Uh, treating them all will just take too long. Uh, you will have to figure out your risk tolerance and in the planning phase and configure the fail conditions accordingly. Um, generally, I think that you should never push product to production with a higher critical vulnerabilities, and the mediums should be treated on a case by case. Um, some of them will be more critical for you, depending on the type of element they and the type of component they exist in. Some of them are less. Even if you decide to push in with some mediums, you really should have a plan how to fix those mediums post launch, preferably in the next upcoming uh, few cycles. Um, also about SAS, like any tool, like any automated tool, they have false positives. So go over the issues and making sure which one are real and which one are not is a good idea. 
And here are some free code scanners. There's Bandit for Python, OWASP SST for PHP and MySQL. And there is also SoraCube, the community edition. It has a coverage of about 17 languages. Uh, for this type of product like SonarCube, some of them do come with the limitation of how much uh, code you can scan, like 10,000 lines or 50,000 lines. So if you expect your product to be bigger than this, then you should look for a SaaS solution that doesn't have this limit. Um, and OS provides us with a very nice list of SaaS tools uh, depending on their language and whether they are both free or commercial. So let's talk about secret scanning. Um, secret scanning is probably one of the most important pre-commit checks. It scans the code for hard-coded credentials and stop you from committing them. And this happens more than you realize. Uh, I remember going to an OWASP talk back in 2017, and the presenter there presented us with a project he worked on for the past five years. Um, and up to that point, his project was uh, going over public, publicly available sources like public uh, repos, public uh, S3 buckets, and searching for hard-coded hard uh, plain text credentials and tokens and API keys and everything. And he found an astronomic number. I don't remember exactly what it was. I think it was like 6 billion, but it just shows you how common it is. And it happens to everybody, whether you knew when you missed it or it happens by accident because you accidentally pushed code from testing. It just happens to everybody. And when it does happen, it's a real pain to deal with it because you need to assume that first off, they're all compromised. You need to start looking and making sure that no real harm is done. And then you need to rotate them. And then you need to search for all the other applications and products that are using those API keys and rotating, rotating them there as well. So it really is a huge headache. And if we can prevent it with some sort of uh, pre-commit hook, then we should do it. Uh, here I can recommend GitLeaks. It's a very nice tool. As you can see here, it checks for a Discord API key and it just prevents you from pushing it. Up to the next phase, let's go to build. Uh, so here we run checks on output artifacts like uh, merged code and containers. We can also run SAS here on the entire code. As you remember in the code phase, we wanted to run it on new code being added. Here we can run the SAS scan on the entire code in completion. So we will have a bit of overlap. And we also have new, uh, two new automated scans here. One of them is a software composition analysis, SCA, and the container scanning. So software composition analysis scans the third-party libraries that you are importing in your code for known vulnerabilities. Um, third-party libraries, the stuff you're importing in your code, are an inherent risk. It's a big piece of code that you import and use in your app with nobody that nobody on the team built and no one can take responsibility of. Um, I'm willing to bet that a lot of projects out there right now have more code in them that is third party than the one that built by the team. And it makes sense to use it, right? Let's look, for example, Ruby on Rails. Why would you build an entire authentication system if you can just import device? There, those are projects that have more people working on them for a longer time than you can afford to work on. So why not use their expertise and just import it? Import it. It's very effective, but it still carries risk because when vulnerabilities are found, they propagate to everyone. Anybody here remember LockForge? <laughs> that, was, that was a fun weekend. Uh, SCI won't stop the next LockForge, but it just shows you how vulnerabilities can creep into your software via third-party libraries, and that can at least catch all the publicly known ones. Uh, OWASP comes in a clutch here again. Uh, they have a project called Dependency Check, which I highly recommend. It's also producing a very nice report that you can show everybody. So highly recommend it. Um, containers are great. I love them. They're small. They spin stuff fast. Um, they're their own little contained system that guarantee to work pretty much everywhere. Again, depending on some network conditions. But if it works on your end and you push it out, it will work on any, any, any other machine. Uh, but they require special attention and have their own best security practices. And they can have an entire talk on their own. Uh, but we won't go too deep into that. It's kind of out of scope. Uh, but because of that, you really should at least run them through some system scan like any other system. What container scans will do, uh, they will spin up the container and check for its libraries for known vulnerabilities and will let you know what libraries are vulnerable so you can fix them, uh, whether it's by applying patches, applying workarounds, or even outright deleting them if they are not in use. And that will really depend on the type of uh, base image you are using. So if, for example, you are importing from uh, Ubuntu latest, it's small, but it still contains a lot of libraries you probably don't need. 
just as a side note, recommendation, you can build it from Alpine. If you need a Linux distro, you can build it from scratch, or you can run it through something called Docker Slim, uh, where you run it with unit tests to see what libraries are not being activated during regular use to remove them. So the scans here that I recommend are Gripe and Claire. Gripe was recommended to me by GitHub Advanced Security Team. And Claire is also a well-known uh, container security scanner, very highly maintained. You honestly can't go wrong with either of them. So let's go to test. Uh, so here we bring up a working version of the product locally or over a network. So it will actually run. And we attack it from the, uh, like an outsider would attack with uh, dynamic application security testing or DAST. The idea here is to find issues that are not that are only visible from the outside. You can't really find them in the code because maybe it's communication between two different components that lead to this injection vulnerability working. So we want to see this is for stuff you can only find once everything is cobbled together and is working. Uh, here, the, my recommendation is OSP Zap. Um, some of you might know it as uh, Burp Suite Free Brother. But wherever I looked, it's pretty much a gold standard. It even comes in packaged in Kali Linux. So I highly recommend it. It has a lot of backing and a lot of history, and it's a very developed and good project. Some notes you should keep in mind when applying DAST. Um, this will run a suite of attacks that can look like a real attack if you're doing it over a monitored network. So make sure to let everybody know that you're running it and to ignore alerts coming from this source to this destination for the next couple of hours or until further notice, just so you won't send somebody on a wild goose chase after an attack that never happened. Um, you can get different results from scan if they're authenticated or unauthenticated. So keep that in mind while running it. And something to remember, when all the other scans take a couple of minutes at most, uh, this scan can take up for an hour, even a day, even more, depending on the size of your application. So. Run it in strategic times, like a major merge or something. Don't run it um, every time because we'll just block the building process. Let's go to release. So by this point, we have pretty much automatically tested all the elements of the product, right? We went through the source code. We made sure there are no hard-coded secrets. Um, the third-party libraries have been scanned. The containers uh, were scanned. We ran a tax suite against the app. So if everything is fine, we are preparing to push to production. We really should check our configuration of the runtime environment, you know, with the bedrock that the entire application is going to run on. We're looking here at uh, access controls, firewall, DNS records, how secret data is managed. Um, when building the, the infrastructure and the configuration management and when testing it, uh, keep in mind the rule of least privilege. Um, meaning that you need to provide the minimal access to entities so there is no abuse of permissions by legitimate users or compromised users or processes or dockers for that case. Well, um, we'll take a bit of sidestep to talk about configuration management and infrastructure as code. Um, you really want to have your configuration and infrastructure defined by code stored in some kind of SCM. Uh, it achieves the following security goals. So. The change management is easier because changes need to be approved before they are committed, uh, pretty much like any additions to code. Yeah, you have a hard barrier before any unwanted changes to the infrastructure are already made. Um, you get an audit trail. So if there's suddenly a new instance somewhere, you can get on the version control and see when exactly was this instance added, who added it, and who approved it. And also with that, you can create an immutable environment. What does it mean? It means that. Once it's been defined by the configuration management and the infrastructure as code, it can be changed. Uh, nobody can come in and make untrackable changes, untrackable fixes. Um, and you can really remove big chunks of your attack vector. So if you have uh, an environment where it's purely defined by your configuration uh, management, for example, salt, you can remove any SSH access to it because there's no point doing some changes that if the system goes down and you need to bring them back up, you need to go in manually and add them if you're lucky enough to remember what they were. Um, so for infrastructure as code, we have Terraform by HashiCorp and we have AWS SDK and any other SDK of any major cloud service. And for configuring for configuration management, we can use Ansible, Chef, SaltStack, um, all are free. So to make sure that your infrastructure is properly configured, you can run a checkoff ISC scanner before you apply changes and deploy the infrastructure. 
Uh, it's kind of like incest for your ISC. Make sure you don't have anything hard coded in uh, any hard coded credentials that you don't have open ports to everybody in the world to like uh, port 22, which is something you really want to avoid. Very low hanging fruits to make sure that your configuration is properly made and secure. Um, it's Python based, so it's very easy to install using pip. Uh, it covers a whole bunch of stuff like Terraform code, Kubernetes, different cloud provider SDK, and others, and it's easily integratable in your CI CD, and it's really worth checking out. So now let's get to the next one, deploy. Um, that's the point where we are dumping stuff into production before launch to see how are they going to behave in their environment that the product is going to live from now on. It's a good place to monitor resource utilization and uh, do last minute checks before officially launching the product. Uh, some open source stuff you can use for monitoring. Um, you have OS Query, Zabbix, Sysdig has been really prominent lately. It's also a very good um, free logging agent that you can put in and transfer logs to your, your other log aggregator or your SIM. And here is also the place when you want to bring in a pen tester. If you want to have one in-house, then that's awesome. You will have no impact on budget. But if you don't, then this is one expense you really shouldn't go cheap on. Uh, you should bring a pen tester. We need some human intelligence to look uh, for issues that the automated tools might have missed. And since we don't have a hacking AI yet, we have to bring a real person to do that. And when we will have a hacking AI, then God help us all. Um, let's talk a bit about chaos engineering. I first encountered this term when I was doing my CCSK, and I think that any Warhammer Fantasy fan would agree it sounds something like the Skaven would come up with. So what it is, uh, the idea behind chaos engineering is to make the environment a little bit le a little bit less hospitable to check the deployment and how resilient it is, right? Imagining you have, for the first week of deployment in prod, you have built-in packet storms, fuzzers, network issues made into the environment. Um, this will force developers to work with resiliency in mind. First off, it will help you find out what does it fail on, but also make developers to work with resiliency, try to build in resiliency into it, because they will know that it's not a question of if we're going to have a secure uh, network issues. Network issues are not a bug. They're a feature, and they're a feature that they're going to need to work with. So you basically force them to think ahead and build some sort of resiliency and backups in. So into monitoring and response, we are entering operations territory. So standard security operations and IT operations come to play here. Um, you should have a SIM in your organization and forward the logs from the logging tools we discussed with them or uh, to some log aggregator you might have. Um, set up custom alerts that are not part of out of the box and something more specific to your application. Uh, working with false positives that might come right out of the box. Um, Another important phase is you should develop a playbook with the developers so that people will know what to do in certain events if they occur. And integrating the developers is really important because they know the product, they know the system better than anybody else. And they can provide you with a lot of hindsight, like um, what happened if certain error comes up, what you need to do, what kind of services can you take down, what the command they might have built in to manage it. So they really should take active part in creating those playbook and policies with you. And you should also have training baked in. So people will at least get some sort of physical practice on what they need to do. Um, just reading and signing on the stuff is not enough. They really need to get practice on it. Um, I'd like to make a side note about something that's called uh, runtime application self-protection, or RASP. It's sort of like the next uh, logical next step from a web application firewall. So how does a WAF works? It sits on a proxy or on the server with some internal routing before the application itself, uh, intercepts uh, incoming traffic, and filters the requests based on rules and signatures. The problem with signature-based protection is that it really is to get around using some kind of obfuscation. You can do different encoding, uh, different fillers, padding, uh, changing one bit at some, uh, some location to change entire hash, for example, if it's for files. So there are ways to get around it. And also, there is no way to know how an input behaves on the application, how it's going to be processed until it's actually there. So RASP sits on the application itself and monitor inputs and functions and how the application behaves to identify attacks and attempt to stop them. Um, two general ways that can be implemented. You can either build the application with RASP in mind, so you're going to follow function, funnel functions through it. It's 
more precise because we get to control what functions we want to be analyzed, which can reduce the overhead. Um, but at the same time, it's kind of more complex because you need to build the application with this thing in mind from the beginning. There's another way which you can just wrap the app inside a RASP and it will monitor all the functions and all the system calls, but it might produce a bit higher of a overhead. So that's up to your consideration. I don't have a tool that I can recommend here because I couldn't find an open source one. Um, the only one I actually find that was open source is called Open RASP by Weibo on GitHub, but all the documentation is in Chinese and I can't read it. Uh, if you'd like to try it and you can read Chinese and you want to give it a go, then search Open RASP on GitHub, but I have not used it, so therefore I cannot officially recommend it. So now we covered everything, we covered all the phases. Uh, let's put it all together. Let's take the CICD pipeline we had from the beginning and see how it looks when all the security checks we wanted to apply are in there. Okay, so let's go with the story. Uh, the user commits the following files you can see in the diagram. And they first they go through SAST, they go through security scanning, and they go through manual review. Once uh, they pass them, they're getting pushed to GitHub and merged with the main. Uh, GitHub Actions Runner will take the code and run it through a complete SAST and SCA. And it will also generate a container image from the Docker file and from all the scripts we want and put them through a container scanner. If these tests passed, uh, the container image will be pushed to a registry and the runner will recreate a local version of the running app and run DAST against it. If it passes DAST, uh, the runner will take the Terraform files and run them through the ISC scanner and the salt uh, state files will go through a manual review. If all of them pass, uh, the runner will then apply the ISC, creating the infrastructure. So the instance, the routing, the firewalls will take the salt state uh, apply it with, con with the local configuration and it will then spin up the Docker image. And like in the previous example, it will deploy the application in full, but it will actually apply all those checks. So as far as developer uh, knows, unless there is a security issue, everything should go smoothly and you should end up with a deployed file at the end. Um, we can clearly see the security gates and checks here for every phase. Uh, and we can see that it covers every element in the CI/CD pipeline. Uh, here I'm going to go over some lessons I learned from working with different developer teams. Uh, some lessons I think can honestly be applied for any type of security engineering position or any security position in general, whether you're considering transitioning into engineering or if you're considering going to the field. Um, like I said, pushing products with no vulnerabilities is usually not cost effective. Uh, figure your risk tolerance and decide what vulnerabilities are to be prioritized and dealt with before launch and what can be dealt with after, but always have a plan to deal with them. Um, the following is uh, kind of important. Remember that security is your main concern, not, not the devs, right? Not the devs, not the product managers, not the managers, not, they have different functions. Their, uh, their job is to create features, push the product, push the product to market, solve bugs. Security is your main concern or responsibility. So when you encounter some pushback for security requirements, understand that it's not necessarily coming from malice or they think it's not important. At this day and age, cybersecurity is on the news all the time. I think everybody agrees it's important, but it not, might not be just on top of their priorities. Um, you will be communicating with uh, developers a lot troubleshooting or remediating vulnerabilities. So get to know the people, uh, get on the good side and learn how to communicate with them because you are gonna be doing a lot of annoying stuff together, especially troubleshooting. And you are another guy coming in with another requirement that kind of breaks their build. It's another thing that they need to deal with. So get used to talking with them and working this stuff out with them to at least make it somewhat more seamless. And also remember that Developers uh, work differently, both as groups and individuals. Some of them may do one push, uh, one code push at the end of day because he does all this work locally. The other ones might do three to four pushes a minute, right? So understand how they work. So implementations are not one size fits all. Get to know them and synergize with them to make sure they are actually using the tools and following up on your scan results. Right, so that was my presentation. Thank you all for coming. And now we'll open the stage for some questions. Awesome, Ite, you got, uh, got several here. Uh, from Jack2, uh, should SAS be run on the developer's local machine or should it run on a build machine by the pipeline on a push to main? 
Um, so it can be run either or. You can uh, assign SAST to run as a pre-commit hook so that you at least go through some kind of um, you know, barrier before you're pushing the code to the repo. But it can be either or, really up to how the developers work and how you feel comfortable implementing it in. Awesome. Uh, I know that there's also like IDE plugins that you can put that, that can also do like source code scanning. Have you mm -hmm. any uh, familiarity with that? So I do have some familiarity with that. Um, yeah, there are some add-ons you can push on, uh, visu on uh, visual code, for example. Uh, I haven't used them personally, so there's not some I can recommend, but anything like linters, any type of uh, scanner does it for you, also great. It's pretty much can be considered like a pre-commit hook because it's done directly on the user's host before the code is being pushed to the repository. So if you can put it in, also recommend it. Sounds good to me. Uh, Ignatius also has a question. Uh, who is responsible to continuously manage the security and patch management of open source scanners, uh, considering that using vendors help mitigate uh, against the need to do that, paying for convenience? Yeah, so who manages that? Uh, the community. That's another. Um, that's another thing that sort of you need to consider while doing the uh, your risk analysis because when you're getting something that's a vendor again like i said they have an army of engineers that do do it for them when it comes to open source it's usually either the community or the uh, or the maintainer of it which is why when you go with something open source it's always important to look for something that has a lot of a lot of commits and have commits done recently it means that it's properly maintained and it's not like out of cycle Okay. Um, we have a, a comment from Scott here. Uh, mostly devs know when and how much code moves, time and change. Give them tools to measure the impact. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, not sure if you have a, have a question there, Scott. Oh, sorry. Continue. Oh, no. I'm saying, uh, you know, Scott, words of wisdom or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Like, keep it up, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, Costa also has a question here. Uh, which paid RASP tool have you used? Uh, he's not looking for a recommendation, just you know, mm -hmm. tell you what. I haven't used any pa any paid RASP. My entire um, project so far while building our DevSecOps pipeline for the same reasons that I've brought before, um, I was mostly trying to look for open source stuff just so I can implement them in faster and then start maybe populating them with more vendor solutions. So I haven't used any uh, paid RASP. I know OWASP also has a list of paid RASPs you can use and recommend, but because they're not open source, I haven't included them in this presentation. Perfect. Um, Jordan2172 also asks, uh, do you have a recommendation on how to get people on board with this sort of security culture? Uh, devs might get scared off due to additional scope. Uh, that, that's the question, Jordan. How do you get people on? That's, uh, that's a very tough question. Um, from my experience, when dealing with people outside of security, you need to try to talk with them in the language they understand. So if it's, for example, with product people, you need to talk with them about um, how when a product is more secure, it will increase trust from client side. Uh, if you're talking to developers, you can also say that it will catch more, uh, more bugs. And again, when you do the shift left and discover the issues before at uh, as early as possible, it's easier to deal with them. And if it is enforced by management, you you really need to have some enforcement by management to tell them that, yes, we need to push out secure products, do whatever it needs. And then you come in and tell them, well, if we do that, we're going to catch all the issues sooner, which will be way easier to fix. So there, there is some level to um, uh, approaching it politically. Yeah, it's not coercion, but it's somewhere Yes. In that area. <laughs> yeah, I was I was trying really hard not to use the word manipulate. <laughs> yeah, 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 of course, of course. Yeah. But you need, you need to sell it to them. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree. Just to kind of add on to the point as well, right? I mean, it's as a developer um, implementing this security solutions and whatnot um, might give them back to like, hey, you know, your codes has issues and they might not take that uh, very kindly. So I think there should be some sort of like support system between you and your manager as well um, to make sure that, hey, you know, we do really need this uh, in order to kind of secure our product before going live, right? So it's Absolutely. a tricky, uh, <laughs> tricky situation. 
Absolutely. Yeah, and, and kind of like tangential to that, like, do you have any experience kind of introducing any of these tools? Because I imagine, you know, if you've never done container scanning before and you start today, you're going to get a lot of findings. So do you have any experience maybe dealing with developers who are kind of pushing back against maybe implementing tools that slow down their development process? So cooperation is uh, the key word here. You need to understand that you are working together towards something and not against each other. Uh, I had experience of some pushback of developers absolutely refusing to use some of the tools because it breaks everything down and something's not working. And if you don't have the backing from management on how to um, basically force them to use it, um, you should either try working with them to troubleshoot it, or at some points, um, you're going to need to generate a test environment on your own, similar to the one they're using, and troubleshoot it for them, just to remove that extra friction. Because again, as I mentioned, security is not their top priority, it's yours. And as much as it's going to share security, the main point of security responsibility is still on you as a security expert of the team. That's a really refreshing opinion. The, the security per person kind of bending over backwards to, to bridge the gap as opposed to just giving work to the, the development team and trying to make them like, yeah, because, because think about it. When you're coming in, you're basically another, you're basically some guy coming in, Hey, put it into your code and your build process, by the way, can break everything. <laughs> so you need to work with a guy, with a person and kind of make it more, uh, easier transition period. Yeah, I totally agree with that. That's a, that's a very good, uh, good thought. Uh, after that, uh, we have uh, Jack too is looking for a copy of your slides. Uh, Itai, if you just send us your slides, we can, we can upload it to the Sure. Uh, not a problem. Uh, yeah. So, so Jack, we'll, we'll upload it to the, to the site. So just, you know, keep a lookout for that. Well, we'll post a message when we do it, but, uh, yeah, just keep checking. Uh, a lot of people are giving you praise. Jordan says, uh, awesome presentation. Claps from Scott. Uh, Jack, too, also says, great presentation. Alex says, brilliant presentation. Uh, Mike Martin, uh, interesting stuff. Thanks uh, for the presentation. Lots of praise and, uh, here, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot, a lot of praise to you, Ty. Uh, great work. And uh, also some great words of wisdom from Scott uh, as well. Um, are there any other uh, questions for uh, Itai before we uh, we close it off? Um, sorry, Adam, maybe we can post the link to the site where um, people can download the sites from. Uh, I mean, the, the slides from um, on the chat, if we have that ready. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we don't have the, the presentation up yet, but uh, we will uh, we'll, we'll do that. But here, I'll, I'll post the slides. Uh, if anybody has questions, just leave it in the chat and we'll... Uh, yeah, I, I actually have a, I have a question for you, Tay, if sure. you don't mind. Um, so you, you mentioned a few like dark modeling frameworks, mainly uh, Pasta and Stride. I'm curious for like your your opinion on like which ones do you prefer, and like why would you prefer one over the other? Between the uh, both, um, either pa Pasta or, or Stride. Know, in general, you know. <laughs> so between both of those. Um, Stride is easier to implement, but Pasta is a bit more realistic. So Stride is very static. It gives you a couple of threats, and you need to uh, put those threats within different location of your application in your data flow and see where it might affect. But the thing is that not all threats are applied equally. Not all threats are um, actually a risk to you. So let's just say you have... Um, Denial of service. Well, maybe you're in the line of business that denial of service is like very minuscule, probably won't happen to you. So not everything is applied. Past on the other hand, is kind of a bit more uh, realistic. It does take more time, and you create um, your own uh, threat library for your business. It mm. takes more time. It's kind of more hands-on because you need to work on it and develop it alongside like other engineers and based on what you're seeing on the network and previously saw on the network. So you kind of need a big more infrastructure and cooperation to build it. Yep. But at the same time, it's going to be way more tailored to you. It's like... Stride is kind of like, you know, a generic suit you buy and pasta is more like tailored to your sizes. Okay, awesome. And then first, I know you also talked about SaaS tools briefly as well. Uh, and you had a point there about like, would you rather have like a tool that does a little bit of everything or do you want to have like a very, very narrow, narrow set of tools that like does some, some things really well? Um, so it, it, following up on that, like, would you pref always want to have a, have a tool that does like, a narrow set of languages really well? Or would you always, would you, Try to stay stay away from like the, the broad skills of tools or 
how would you want to go about that? So that would depend on a couple of things. First off, what kind of languages you work in in your tech stack and mm -hmm. also your size. So if you are, for example, a big company, an enterprise, you have a bunch of different development teams that might be working in diff with different uh, languages and you want to have just one SaaS tool with a server that will apply for everybody, you might want something with more coverage just so you won't have to import in a new SaaS and a new process for every time you're using a new language. And if you're a smaller company and you know that and you're using one tech stack, a um, certain number of languages that, uh, and you know it's not going to increase from that point, might be better to use uh, set, multiple SaaS for those specific languages. I see. And, you know, given the, the general praise for you in, in, in the chat here, I'm wondering, uh, would, you, would you be interested in coming back and doing, you know, uh, DevSecOps, but not on a shoestring budget, like a full-blown <laughs> multi-dollar <laughs> DevSecOps pipeline. I think that would be quite interesting. <laughs> yeah, that would be quite interesting. Um, the thing is, I don't really want to present you about products that I've read reviews of, and mm -hmm. I didn't have uh, hands-on uh, experience with a lot of them. So I don't know if I can actually come over and say, um, yeah, I recommend this and this tool because a lot of them cost money and I personally don't have money and I can't tell my company to like, hey, let's buy all those tools. I have a presentation a couple of months that I want to do. <laughs> yeah. But in general, if anybody interesting on a DevSecOps transformation and not on a shoestring budget, uh, imagine this entire presentation, just not open source. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's good. Uh, uh, it looks like we, we don't have any, any more questions, but I just have, have one kind of closing question. Um, like, how do you like test out new tools in the pipeline? Do you have like a like kind of a, a dev or, or environment, or do you just do it in, like a home lab? Like, yeah. So uh, for anybody who wants to build a kind of test environment for this, um, there are a couple of ways, but you can't do it completely for free. So if anybody wants to actually get their hands on on like generally DevOps uh, and DevSecOps, what I recommend you to do is to build. Um, CI CD pipeline. So use uh, GitHub repo completely for free. Uh, spin up an AWS free tier and spin up one instance as it, and install Jenkins on it. Webhook Jenkins to that repository. And from then you can pretty much already have a CI CD workflow built. Just start configuring. And mm -hmm. you're basically there and you have a test environment for all the tools you want to put in. And after that, jumping to GitHub Actions is really easy. GitHub Actions is like very simple compared to Jenkins. Sounds good. Yeah, I, I think uh, Jack was telling about this before that he also really likes it too. But uh, yeah, thank you, Itai. Uh, looks like we're, uh, you know, don't have any more questions or concerns. Uh, do you have an email or any kind of contact details that anybody can, can use to reach you? Uh, yeah, sure. It's best to reach me on uh, LinkedIn. I have uh, put my LinkedIn contacts in the slide, in the second slide. So yeah, that's the best place to reach me. Awesome. Uh, so yeah, you heard that uh, audience, and uh, yeah, thank you, Itai, for the presentation. Very much uh, loved by your your audience here. Um, awesome. And, uh, <laughs> Happy it went well. <laughs> and uh, no tech tech issues. That's uh, that's always good. A day without a tech issue is a good day. Yeah. Now we can knock on wood because it's it's over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. Uh, awesome. Uh, well, yeah. Thank you again, Itai, for for coming out. Uh, great presentation. Awesome. And, thank uh, you for having me. You know, yeah, you're, you're welcome back anytime. Thanks to our sponsors as well. Don't forget to leave feedback. Uh, take care. Oh, I, I will. That's going to be the first thing I'm going to do after this. <laughs> yeah. Enjoy the weather. It's still sunny and beautiful and you know, weather. 22 degrees outside. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank uh, you.